lab-grown meats becoming more of a thing day by day, unless you are, of course, in the states of Florida and Alabama, and whether you're excited for it, have no idea what the heck it is, or you're terrified of it, your federal government is going to be spending multi-millions of dollars on a new study that could see U.S. service members as targets of this strange new guinea pig program. Joining us is Jack Hubbard, the executive director of the Center for the Environment and Welfare, to shed a little bit of light. Jack, thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me, Tony. So first of all, I want to ask very clearly here, this organization, this uh, BioMaid that you guys have described and linked in your statement, it's described as a public and private biomanufacturing consortium. And uh, it's also funded in part by the U.S. DOD. How does that work? You know, it's a public-private partnership, and this entity has received over $500 million worth of funding from the Department of Defense, which is essentially taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. And this organization has come out and they've released an RFP, a request for proposals, to provide uh, essentially asking lab-grown meat companies to submit requests for funding so that they can receive grants to the tune of potentially up to several million dollars. And this whole program that they've announced is essentially designed to, quote unquote, meet their climate goals for the Department of Defense. And their premise is that they're seeking to give grants to organizations to further the lab-grown meat space, which we can talk about in a minute why it's so problematic, with, you know, I think one can assume the eventual goal of the Department of Defense embracing this new novel product segment and serving it to our troops, which has a lot of people scratching their heads. And, and frankly, there's also some health, safety, and national security concerns that are associated with this development. So, I mean, if you actually take a look at this plan, it's full of so many weird things, and we could start all over the place. But I, I do want to ask uh, if you noticed that they, in their rubric for how to get funding, that you not only had to prove uh, that you had, like you said, a lot of climate goals regarding this uh, weird uh, meat production um, through very weird cancerous cell production, which we can talk about in just a second, but also about uh, necessitating that proposals must be diverse. Uh, and of course, a lot of like weird DEI goals right off the bat talking about uh, some kind of diversity makeup for these studies. Just from your reading in the past with the DOD, what are they referring to here? What's the diversity quota that needs to be met in this rubric for the Department of Defense to shell out cash? You know, to be frank, I'm not familiar with their diversity requirements, but that type of language is the tell. And the tell is that this is a politically motivated, agenda-driven initiative right. that is not really being driven by you know, the, the priorities that I think most Americans think that the Department of Defense should be driven by, right? We like need to advancing have the United States defense capabilities. I, I mean, when you look at our armed forces, we have a generations that have stood up the fiercest, most effective freedom fighting force the world has ever seen. We've literally liberated continents. Mm -hmm. We fought back evil. We protected the freedoms of Americans and our liberty. And now you have this politically driven agenda, which, as you mentioned, this document reeks of, that's essentially saying, hey, we want to hand out up to millions of dollars to lab grow meat companies so that we could develop this stuff. Obviously, you know, connect the dots with the goal of feeding this to our troops. And when you look at the lab grown meat segment, a lot of people are concerned about it for a few reasons. Number one, you need to look at how this stuff is made. Yeah, as a biology, as a former biology teacher and an anatomy and physiology teacher, I'm seeing some really weird stuff here. There's a lot of stuff regarding uh, how it has to be set up, how the cells have to be chosen, some red flags, you know, fly up. And then you're talking about the weird chemical composition inside. What did you call these bioreactors? I yeah. mean, it, it, it as again, as a former biology teacher, it kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies, to use the scientific term. Give us a little bit more insight on the production of this stuff. So about a year ago, uh, the Biden FDA approved the sale of this stuff within the United States. And after that uh, government approval, a whole lot of information has come out where both reporters, activists, and consumer advocates have raised concerns. So when you look at how it's made, 
what they do, many companies, they use something called immortalized cells. That's immortal, like living forever, you know, is, is mm -hmm. the root of the word. And immortalized cells replicate in perpetuity, almost behaving like a tumor. Right. And what they do is they take these cells, which were, by the way, developed for medical research, not for human consumption. They put them in a stainless steel bioreactor. They then need to feed it right? A, a whole bunch of hormones and chemicals in order to get that replication over and over and over again. And then once that's, you know, replicated and created, they then mold it into something that looks like a meatball or a piece of meat and they serve it and they call it lab grown meat. The problem is that when you dig into the patents that these organizations, these lab grown meat companies have put out, mm -hmm. the exact chemical formulas are not often disclosed because they consider them proprietary. Right. They're their secret sauce. And people, you know, everyone from parents to transparency advocates to natural food advocates are saying, well, wait a minute, why are we pushing this stuff on the American public? And two states have taken action. Florida and Alabama have banned this stuff saying, hey, there's no long-term health studies. We have serious concerns. This is a solution in search of a non-existent problem. We have great natural farm-raised meat in this country. It's healthy. We've been eating it for thousands of years. Why are we pushing this stuff? And this is the next step where you have a DOD-funded organization saying, well, if, they're, if consumers aren't going to eat this stuff and buy it, we're going to consider trying to use taxpayer dollars to advance it. And what I'm really worried about is this idea that it's going to be fed to our soldiers. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at the U.S. military, we have a recruitment crisis right now. Right. The military is missing its recruitment numbers. Do you really think there's going to be lines around the block at the recruitment office when potential candidates to join the military find out that they may be fed lab-grown, chemically-laden meat? Now, look, that's one, of, that's, that's one of the key issues that, that I've seen in this is the idea that our troops would be getting this kind of stuff in their MREs or, excuse me, if you're in the Air Force, that would be the five course meals you get at fancy restaurants on post. Uh, <laughs> uh, those things aside, yeah, you're right. No service member is going to want this really weird, again, looking at some of these samples that I've observed, very stringy, uh, again, chemically unknown meats. And this is one of the things I wanted to get your take on. So the... Food and Drug Administration made a really big deal in the second half of the century about making uh, the second half of the 20th century, excuse me, about making sure that all ingredients were listed on the product that was sold to the public so that they could make a decision for themselves if they wanted to consume the things that went into making that product. Yet now I'm seeing a case in which the U.S. Department of Defense is now subsidizing organizations who, like you said, are keeping these proprietary recipes and replication processes kind of to themselves. And there's no transparency to the public for which these processes have been approved. So I don't know if they're using, I mean, who knows what they're using to actually create these kind of environments in which you can get these, uh, these cell systems to replicate, you know, nigh on eternity. It's, it's just weird to see the government going from restricting certain things and requiring transparency to selectively subsidizing things with, like you said, a clear political goal like ESG or DEI. You know, it, in a free market, consumers get to vote with their pocketbook, right? Right. And enough people have voiced concern about this that we've seen multiple states take action, both in terms of banning this novel product until we get more health and safety data and also clear transparency laws that clearly state on packaging, labeling, lab-grown versus natural farm-raised, which is a very common sense thing to provide, right? People ought to be able to know what they're buying and what they're feeding their family. I'm a dad of four. I wouldn't feed this to my kids based on the information you know, that I have. I wouldn't but, feed this to my dog at the moment. <laughs> right. But w w when you look at this stuff in a free market, this sort of sorts itself out as long as you have an educated public, and we've been educating the public about it. What's really disturbing is the idea that the government is going to use its influence, its supply chain, and taxpayer dollars and funding to potentially fund this you know, very strange-sounding private-public partnership that's putting out these requests for proposal and funnel money potentially to lab-grown meat companies, which are honestly facing significant headwinds, both legislatively and also with consumers. 
And we shouldn't be using the government to pick winners and losers. And we also shouldn't be experimenting on our soldiers, right? Mm, and potentially yeah. introducing this you know, new novel food source to them because they deserve better. If anything, we should be feeding them natural farm-raised protein as they go out and, yeah. and defend our liberties right. and, and freedoms. They should be fed the best of the best. So I know we're running a little bit short on time here, but I cannot help but ask this, that one of the aims of the document, again, that is a call, kind of an opportunity to receive some kind of partnership grant situation regarding these lab-grown meats is discussing the improvement of carbon capture technologies. Do you have any idea what they're talking about in relation to carbon capture technologies in relation to lab grown meats? Or is this just a buzzword to maybe make it a little more politically progressive? You know, I, it's a multi-level proposal. So they're looking they're potentially to fund multiple different types of products. Right. Cell cultivated is one of them. And the irony here is that they have it backwards. UC Davis, right? The university has put out a study that says that the emissions of the lab-grown meat industry actually have the potential to be 25 times higher or worse than natural farm-raised beef because the amount of energy input that needs to go into running mm -hmm. these bioreactors, the pharmaceutical grade, you know, hormone and chemical. Um, yeah, to refine the chemicals necessary to stabilize the environments in those bioreactors. So, so, so this is up is down, down is up. We're going to save the climate by serving people lab-grown meat, which may actually have a 25 times worse emissions uh, you know, output. It, it's absolutely insane. It's almost Orwellian, the yeah. way that the, these groups are pushing this stuff. And the science and the facts aren't on their side. It's like shooting yourself in the foot to solve some kind of a foot ache. It's, it's quite surreal. Jack Hubbard, executive director of the Center for the Environment and Welfare. Thank you very much for stopping on with us and giving us a little bit of insight into what's going on. And uh, we look forward to following you as well as a bipartisan bill banning this stuff in the future. All right. Thanks so much, Tony. We'll be back in just a moment. This is the Tony Kennett cast here on 93 WIBC and The Daily Signal.